Hi, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for coming. I'm Carl. I'm one of the deputy directors um, at the Mile End uh, Institute, and I want to welcome you all to what is our 15th event of this academic uh, year. Tonight, we are thinking about British politics. Um, and we have two people who know a great deal about it. Carolyn Quinn is 36, uh, in 36 years at the BBC, interviewed many, many political figures in her time on the PM, the Today programme, and the Westminster Hour. Politics and the media and the BBC itself went through a lot of change during that period. And Carolyn's insight is remarkable. Tim Bale is Professor of Politics right here at Queen Mary, and tonight is a launch event for his new book, The Conservative Party After Brexit, Turmoil and Transformation. The book covers six and a bit years of politics, and the cover has four prime ministers on it, which tells you something. Tim is an authority on politics and political parties. He is also, I have to say, a very kind, thoughtful, and generous person too. He has been one of those fantastic mentors for me who always seems to believe in you, sometimes more than you believe in yourself. In short, he's a great guy, so do buy his book. <laughs> Checks in the post. <laughs> uh, this evening, Carolyn and Tim are going to talk about the book for the first half of the event, so up to around 30 minutes or so. And then we will move to your questions for the second half, uh, which may last a little longer than that. So please join me in welcoming Carolyn. Thank you very much, Carl. And welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming along to this. I mean, it's a pleasure for me to talk to Tim about this book. I know how hard he's worked on it and the amount of research in it. Uh, it's a fantastic read, although it does actually bring you out in a rash when you think <laughs> of what we've been through. I think we've all been a bit like... Um, frogs boiling, haven't we, in the pan, that we didn't quite realise what we were going through until it was possibly a bit too late. Uh, so you have documented so many points that we can discuss tonight, and I'm going to ask Tim some questions, and you'll have your chance to ask him questions as well. But um, Tim, I suppose, let's start with a very, very basic question, which is, what led you to write the book in the first place? And do you really think, I mean, look at the title, the Conservative Party after Brexit, but are we far away enough from the Brexit referendum now to really be able to judge its impact, do you think? Well, I mean, on the second question, <laughs> I mean, when is Brexit going to be over? I suggest probably never, uh, really. It's uh, something that I think most Conservative MPs now think is sort of disappearing in the rearview mirror. Um, but I think the, the implications, obviously, for the economy, for diplomacy, etc., you know, will be with us for, for decades. Um, I think probably with regard to the Conservative Party, clearly there will be um, implications, you know, uh, ripple effects that go on for years uh, as well. As far as why I chose to wrote, write this book, I mean, I've written two books about the Conservative Party before, so in some senses I am kind of horribly fascinated um, <laughs> by this um, incredibly successful political party. And I guess in particular, I get fascinated when it gets into trouble. Um, uh, the book I wrote um, before this one, which was the Conservative Party from Thatcher to Cameron, really started at a point where the Conservatives were at a, a very low ebb. Um, you know, they'd lost in 1997. They really couldn't seem to get themselves together. Uh, and then there was a, a very slow process of reform under David Cameron. So uh, I guess I was interested in why this machine, really, that has been... Um, so successful, sometimes runs into trouble, and then what it does about it when that happens. And, and that brings me on to this book, because when I first conceived of it, it was when uh, the party had once again kind of run itself into the ground, really, under Theresa May. And in effect, by you know, 2018, 2019, was really on the verge of a nervous breakdown, actually. And I remember um, when I applied for, for the research grant um, from Leverhulme, which, which helped me um, write this book, 
that was the title of the, the research application, was, was um, Party on the um, Edge of a Nervous Breakdown. And uh, I guess, you know, it was once again this puzzlement, really, as to why a party that, you know, has been so successful over the years, I mean, it's dominated British politics, sometimes gets into so much trouble, and then what it can do to get itself out of that, and how adaptable it is. And um, I guess it's, it's a roller coaster ride in some ways, this book, because, as I say, I conceived of it when the party was at a desperately low ebb, and you can remember in 2019, in the European Parliament elections, it was uh, below 10% in that election, and that's the worst Conservative performance ever, really. And yet, within a few months, it won an 80-seat majority uh, in Parliament, which in some ways you know, suggests some kind of miracle and some kind of miracle worker, if you, if you think about Boris Johnson. So I was interested in, in, in that, I guess, you know, pattern of um, you know, the slough of despond and then suddenly turning into you know, this triumph, really. Well, you mentioned Boris Johnson, of course, the 80-seat majority. Um, but since then, he's lost that majority. Well, he's still got some of it in the parliament, of course, but uh, the party's credibility has really been dragged over the coals, hasn't it? And, uh, you know, you've had Liz Truss, the Liz Truss period, what, 45? 49 days as, oh, 49 as Prime Minister. 49 days, yes, yes. excuse me. That's yes, official, 40, yeah. 49 days. Yeah. And uh, now Rishi Sunak. The book, you actually open it with a quotation, and this is it. Those who know how to win are much more numerous than those who know how to make proper use of their victories. Um, are you trying to tell us something about these individuals, <laughs> or is this what we should generally just think about people who rise to the top of their parties at West? Minister. Well, I mean, clearly, I think every political party is, in some sense, is dominated by the desire to win elections. And I think that does tend to make for quite short time horizons. And I think it does tend to, therefore, promote figures who uh, are, if you like, electorally orientated rather than um, policy orientated. Now, I think the acme of that would obviously be Boris Johnson, um, someone who I think had uh, zero interest in policy <laughs> and really not very much idea about what he wanted to do other than become Prime Minister uh, and uh, no sense of, of um, a follow-on, if you like, to, to that election victory. I think to a degree you could argue that um, uh, possibly uh, Liz Truss and even um, Rishi Sunak, and particularly Theresa May, are slightly different figures. I mean, I think Theresa May is more of a serious politician. You can see that, actually, not just during her premiership, where she was desperately fighting to, to, to get Brexit through, but actually in her kind of post-premiership um, career, where you know she has made some quite significant interventions on policy issues and clearly does um, feel very strongly about some issues. For example, the Modern Slavery Act, mm. which we, she was uh, instrumental in, in in getting through. So, but you make the, you make the point that privately she was in despair about being succeeded by Boris Johnson because yeah. she she questioned his morality effectively, didn't she? Yeah, I mean, she questioned his morality. She questioned his fitness for office. Absolutely, yes. I mean, I think she's very disappointed by that. Liz Truss, interestingly, I mean, we can come on to talk about her later, maybe. But I mean, in in some ways, her downfall was partly because she's quite a policy oriented politician. That's Ideologue. Not, yes. I mean, that's not to say she wasn't sort of personally ambitious and she wanted to get to the top for, you know, the, those kind of personal reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, she wanted to get there because, as you say, she is in some senses an ideologue and, and has an agenda for Britain, which she wanted to um, push through, <laughs> obviously push through um, too quickly. And, and likewise, I guess, you know, Rishi Sunak, you, you could argue, um, is quite an ideological politician. He's not just there to be there in, this, in, in the way that Boris Johnson was. But I mean, coming back to your, your, your question, I think, um, you know, parties now, partly because of the kind of 24-7 media we have, um, are so focused on the day-to-day, -day, so focused on winning or trying to retain power. We have a kind of, we've moved into a sort of permanent campaign mode in the way that US politics is, is, has been, um, you know, very, very strong on. Uh, and I think that does mean they, they have less time to think about what they want to do <laughs> once they've won. Uh, and, um, you know, actually very often squander the opportunities that um, their, their victories have, have given them. Well, I suppose, you know, for Rishi Sunak now, he's got very little time 
in effect to stamp his mark on the party before going to the polls. I mean, we've got local elections coming up, for instance. So for him, do you think that they can be regarded as a test? If, if the Conservatives do pretty badly in those, will that be a, a, a mark on him? Or will people say, well, look, he hasn't had much time? I think that's a really good question. I mean, I think um, Liz Truss so created the, the Conservative brand, if you like, that um, almost you know, any improvement on Liz Truss is, is going to be an improvement. And Rishi Sunak, um, clearly, I think, you know, if you look at his polling, um, as far as the public are concerned, is an improvement on, on her. I mean, I think there's a lot of expectation management going on, as there always is, as you know, um, mm. in, in uh, advance of these elections. And you have a lot of Conservative MPs, the, the party chairman, um, Greg Hans, you know, talking about losing a thousand seats um, in order, hopefully, that they lose slightly fewer than that and, and therefore they can declare it um, uh, as a win. But uh, I mean, I, I think Sunak has been quite clever in identifying, you know, these five tests, if you like, or these, these five, um, you know, pledges that he's made. Uh, most of which are fairly easily uh, achievable and, you know, is being, um, I, I guess, has, has tried to suggest um, to the public that if he passes those tests, then he ought to be given a, uh, another chance. I mean, I think the one big problematic one is obviously, you know, the, the stop the boats um, pledge. He's, he's made that so central and I think that's such a difficult one to actually meet uh, that that could backfire on him. And, I, and, and indeed, I think, you know, if you... If you think about the Conservative Party in recent years, I think uh, you know immigration in some senses has been this you know temptation for them all the time to major on immigration. But mm. on the other hand, it is <laughs> it's kind of kryptonite in a way as well because they 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 have tended to overpromise and underdeliver on it. And yet, in order to hold together this coalition that Boris Johnson built, mm. um, they they seem still to to be dragged back towards making promises on immigration. Um, despite the fact that actually it's got them into quite a lot of trouble really since 2010. Although, you know, plenty of people will say, OK, you're exploiting, if you like, populist tropes. However, um, the, if you're talking about sort of radical populism mm. or, or however you want to term it, a lot of the public like the message about immigration and the, the, the key message for Labour MPs in particular is uh, don't be sort of sucked into feeling that it's all going your way. Um, you don't know what the public really are making of the message on immigration, mm -hmm. on culture wars and that, that kind of thing. Is that, is that a view that you share? Yeah, I mean, the, the transformation that I talk about in the book is essentially um, a, a transformation from a kind of mainstream centre-right party um, that the Conservative Party has, you know, always been, you can argue, um, towards becoming, a, uh, you know, what I call an ersatz populist radical right party. In other words, becoming much more, um, if you like, ukip -y or brexit -y, uh, or indeed reform uk <laughs> um, than, um, you know, traditionally conservative, if you like. Um, some of the things that the Conservative government have um, talked about uh, as far as immigration is concerned and as far as kind of anti-woke politics are concerned do sound like the kind of things you would expect to hear from um, you know, a, a populist radical right um, politician. Mm -hmm. um, not just you know, uh, in terms of Nigel Farage and um, uh, his successor, Richard Tice, but also if you look at the continental European um, situation, you know, there are an awful lot of uh, radical right-wing populists, some of whom are in power, some of whom are, are in opposition, who, who talk the same kind of language as the Conservative Party is talking. And I think you know, there is a question as to whether this represents yet another chapter, if you like, in the Conservatives' mm. ability to adapt and change, or whether it's a kind of one-way street towards uh, you know, becoming actually quite a different party. Uh, in a way, you know, and, and, and perhaps moving towards the kind of thing that we see, although I think sometimes the, the, the analogy can be overdone, in, in Hungary, for example, you know, and Viktor Orban uh, there. I wouldn't want to make an exact analogy or an exact comparison, but, you know, I, I think, you know, some of the things that we've seen, um, particularly, you know, on sort of democratic backsliding, you know, you can talk about voter suppression, maybe you can talk about... Um, 
reducing the autonomy of the Electoral Commission. You can talk about, you know, reviewing judicial review, those kinds of things. Uh, and actually, you know, suggest, well, actually, this is not the kind of thing that you expect from a kind of centre-right party. It's the kind of thing you would expect from a centre-right party moving in quite a populist, radical right direction. Um, however, there, there's the, the, the issue that they've got to think about is which voters are they trying to appeal to? Or are they trying to hold on to their current voters? And so you've got the red wall appeal, but also the blue wall appeal. So, yeah. so where does what you've just said fit into those seats in the, yeah. in the South in particular, yeah. where the, the Lib Dems might yeah. be threatening? Yeah, I mean, there is a trade-off there, I think. You're right to point that out, uh, in, in the sense that, you know, some of the messages that are clearly targeted at those so-called red wall voters um, and they're not just in the red wall, of course. They're, they're you know, mm. um, you know, putting it quite bluntly. They they tend to be, um, you know, less educated. They're not university graduates. They tend to be white. They tend to be a little bit older, etc. Um, some of those messages don't go down very well with, you know, the more affluent, better educated voters uh, and particularly younger voters uh, in in other places and in particular, obviously, in you know the mm -hmm. southeast and around you know parts of, of London. So there's a trade-off there, but the fact fact is that the Conservatives' majorities in most of those seats are sufficiently solid to allow them to actually lose quite a lot of votes and still actually win the, the seat. Now, there are some places where, as you quite rightly say, the Lib Dems could snatch um, you know, some, some victories. But we're probably only talking, famous last words, about 15 to, to, to 20 <laughs> right. seats. We're not being recorded yeah. or anything. Whereas, <laughs> oh, I see whereas, we are. <laughs> Um, you know the, the the potential losses in the so-called red wall in the in the north and the Midlands are actually much much um, higher. So you know if you're if you're going to trade off, you're probably best advised to trade off in in that particular direction, if you like. And, and I think you're right to say that this is all about, in some ways, trying to hold together the electoral coalition that Boris Johnson put together um, in, in 2019. Um, but we've sort of leapt ahead to the future, really, yeah. but, but let's just delve into the, the book a little bit, because yeah. there are a couple of points that you make quite frequently about the party in the media. Yeah. It's a phrase that comes up time and time again. What exactly do you mean by that? And how influential do you think they've been? And, and was there an equivalent when it came to new Labour, right. you know, because you're talking about the, the media backing uh, the message that the Tory leader is putting out. But I mean, I think back to the, the new Labour years, the message discipline, you know, the rebuttal unit and uh, the sun. It was the sun what won yeah. it for, for Tony Blair, wasn't it? Uh, well, arguably, yeah. Well. I mean, the, the, the phrase, the party in the media, I think, um, originates uh, from the um, tendency of political scientists, anyway, to anatomise political parties in, in three ways. So we tend to talk about the party on the ground, which is the membership and the activists, or we talk about uh, the, the party in, in central office, which is the, the staffers at HQ, and we talk about the, the party in um, public office, which is MPs. Um, but I think you can't really understand the Conservative Party without understanding that there is another, if you like, integral part of the Conservative Party, which is the party in the media, by which I mean the, not only the proprietors, but the columnists, the leader writers, and even to some extent, some of the reporters, and certainly some of the subs who create their, their, um, the headlines, um, who uh, actually shouldn't be seen as a sort of outside the, the Conservative Party. They're very much part of the Conservative milieu, if you like. They don't necessarily pay their subs and, and belong to local associations, but I think they have far more influence within the Conservative Party, and particularly on the leadership and MPs, than uh, you know, the, the, the activists or even some of those MPs um, themselves. I mean, and, and do, do you think that they've been far more active and influential during this particular period than, say, even at the, in the earlier stages yeah. of the, the coalition? Yeah, I mean, I think they've always been an important part, but I think as um, the, the media in this country has become ever more partisan, and, you, and I think you can see that over time, um, 
they become more influential. I, I, I think that's definitely the case. And I mean, you can see if we, if we you know, delve into the book, as you say, um, for example, on, on, on Brexit and particularly on COVID, you know, they play a, a massive part in trying to push the leadership in a particular uh, direction. Um, you know, they were deeply critical, obviously, of Theresa May after a while, particularly after the 2017 uh, general election loss. You know, it was clear they'd made up their mind that, you know, she was a loser and she needed to go and her Brexit deal just wasn't good enough for them and that Boris Johnson needed to um, replace her. And, you know, they, they played a big part, I think, in, in her uh, troubles. And then when it came to COVID, you could see that, um, you know, a lot of the pressure to open up, not to lock down, um, obviously was coming from a group of Conservative MPs, coming actually from Rishi Sunak as well, uh, but was also very much buttressed and, and, um, and amplified, if you like, by the, the party in the media, by which, you know, we're normally talking about the Telegraph, the Mail, even the Express, even though it's got fewer readers, Spectator, for example, and maybe nowadays you might want to include um, GB News, for example, mm. in, in that as well. So I, I guess, you know, coming back to the, the question, I guess what I want to say, partly to actually my kind of fellow political scientists, but also everybody else, is that you, you, can't see, you can't see those proprietors, you can't see those columnists, those op-ed writers, those leader writers, those subs, you can't see them as outside the party because you can't, you can't understand the party unless you realise what a great deal of power they've got. And we are, um, you know, in terms of conventional wisdom, still obsessed with this question of whether, you know, the, the media... Uh, can have an effect on voters, um, you know, and I think there is some evidence to suggest that they can, but it's probably less than it ever was. Um, but actually, if you're looking for media influence on politics in this country, it's on the politicians themselves. Now, ironically, that influence on the politicians themselves in part comes from a misplaced belief among those politicians that the media has an effect on voters. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I would be a little bit more sceptical about that. But nevertheless, it, you know, it, I think a lot of politicians still believe that, you know, the Sun or the Mail um, and the Telegraph, you know, do have a certain sway. And therefore, um, you know, it is important um, to um, get them on side. And of course, there is a wider argument. And someone like... Um, uh, uh, Steve Richards would, would always make this point that actually, um, you know, they have an influence on broadcasters as well. And they help set the agenda and therefore, to some extent, you know, if you want to influence broadcasters, then you're going to need to have those papers on side and you're going to need to get them to push what you want um, you know, because because it then has this knock on, this ripple effect mm. for the for the BBC and ITV, etc. Et but it's, it's worth remembering, isn't it? They don't always get it right, do they? No. Uh, you know, no. because you you point out um, Theresa May embarking on those with, withdrawal negotiations, um, and she declared that she would be prepared to walk away with no deal at all, and the right wing press was ecstatic. Steel of the new Iron Lady, oh, yeah. they said. Yeah. Yeah. And um, do you remember? after Liz Truss's budget. Um, you know, the headlines were all finally, at last we've got a, a proper Conservative budget. So, you know, it's momentary, isn't it? It's, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it passes and uh, yeah. they can change their opinions quite quickly. Well, they, they certainly can about individual leaders, you're right. And I think, you know, for, for many of those newspapers in particular, you know, it's coming back to an earlier question, their priority is the Conservative victory at uh, the election because it's in their interests and very often in the interests of the proprietors but also you know their ideological interests to have a conservative government so much like the conservative party you know it, it, it is quite ruthless you're you're absolutely right if it if it realizes it's got it wrong or it's picked the wrong person um, then it will act um, you know very swiftly and I mean it, it goes really with the conservative party as a whole I mean John Ramsden who's a uh, uh, you know, a, a historian from Queen Mary University, and you know, now since um, passed away, um, called the Conservative Party an autocracy tempered by assassination. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that's still very much the case. You know, that's, that's always been the case, and it's certainly not changed now, which is why we've got four people on the cover of the book in six and a half years. Yeah. Um, you, you also talk, I mean, we're talking about the influence of the press, but also the main impact, it seems... 
from the book and from your reading of it is the power that it gave to groups like the mm. European research group, the ERG, the Spartans, as they became known, who wanted to ensure that Theresa May initially didn't slip from her message of Brexit means Brexit. Mm. Um, and it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I remember talking to MPs at the time who said, you know, give them red meat, they will just come back for more. And at the start of the negotiations, they probably would have been quite happy with something that was maybe reduced um, uh, involvement with the European Union. Uh, but the more they got, the more they wanted. Uh, so tell me your thoughts about the impact of those groups and, and what part they played in, in the downfall of yeah. some of these individuals. Yeah, I mean, I think they, they are very significant. I think sometimes their influence can be a little bit overplayed. And I think it's sometimes tempting, and forgive me for saying this, it's sometimes tempting for journalists to um, overplay their influence, um, partly because... Um, you know, sometimes if you've got one or two sources, uh, I'm not talking about you here, you know, to, to, to back up a, a story, um, it's, it's much better for you if you can say, uh, you know, someone from the ERG or someone from the COVID recovery group, because it gives more of a yeah. sense of, you know, not just this one person I happen to be able to get on the phone. <laughs> and also they night. happen to be in the central lobby quite a lot yeah, when we were yeah. hanging around with our yeah, microphones. Yeah, exactly. and, uh, so There so, was always somebody available. Yeah. You can, you, one can overdo it. But having yeah. said that, I think um, clearly when it came to um, Brexit, as you say, I think the ERG did have um, uh, a big effect, um, especially after 2017, obviously, when they played this very pivotal role. I mean, without them, she could not get, Mrs May could not get her Brexit deal through. So they were absolutely crucial. Uh, and they knew it. And they made up her mi their minds that she was a loser. She needed to go. She wasn't going to give them the Brexit that they wanted. And you're quite right to say, actually, their, their view of what they could get and what they wanted did change over time. Um, it did get, if you like, more kind of radical and, and more extreme, some people would see. You know, and maybe they would have been happy with a customs union type relationship if that had been yeah. the initial offer. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think that, that's right. And I, and I think in particular, you know, when she started to talk about, you know, no deal is better than a bad deal, I think that was a, a, a real mistake on her part because it, I think it, it made people realise in the ERG, etc., that suddenly no deal was actually a possibility. Yeah. And, and some of them really did want... Um, some of them really did want that. I think the ERG also, uh, and some of its members, have an influence also right throughout the party. Um, and, and this is where kind of, you know, you see this interaction, if you like, between the elite in the party and the, the, the grassroots, because they become kind of celebrity politicians in themselves. And that, I think, does help to move the, the grassroots in a particular direction. And then, of course, the grassroots will put pressure on their MPs, whether they're members of the ERG or, or not, to, 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 to follow this line. So I think one of the things that we've seen in the Conservative Party is the rise of sort of celebrity disruptors, if you like, like Rhys Mogg. Uh, in particular, Boris Johnson, in some senses, is a, an example uh, of, of that as well. And that, I think, has made a big difference. And that is where I think developments in, in the media are quite important in the sense that, you know, social media in particular and 24-7 media allows MPs to become kind of legends in their own lunchtime mm. really, really quickly yeah. um, and gives them an alter alternative route to power. Um, so someone like Suella Braverman, uh, someone like um, Jacob Rees-Mogg, in effect, get parachuted into you know the, the, the front rank of politics, um, partly because you know they have this ERG branding uh, mm. and they become you know very popular. I think Conservative Home actually has something partly to do with this. I'm not kind of holding them responsible, but you know the the fact that they oh, the rankings. yeah they have a kind of monthly ranking of, of Conservative politicians. You know, and yeah. Conservative politicians do care where they are in those rankings, and I think you know the the, the leadership knows who's popular and who's not popular. And that makes a difference to people's cabinet choices. And I think you can see in Rishi Sunak's cabinet, you know, he's quite clearly put Suella Braverman there, partly because she, you know, she, she pushes policy in a direction that he thinks mm. will be electorally fruitful, but also because he needs that side of the party, he needs that kind of grassroots, you know, support, and, and that helps him. And he hasn't given John Hayes a job yet, then, the common common sense group leader. Uh, no, who, uh... but by, by giving <laughs> Suella Braverman a job, he's probably given John Hayes a job. All right. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, we shall see how that develops. Um, 
Interesting, though. Do, do you think that they still have that same hold over the party? Because watching that vote on the Windsor mm. agreement, um, does that suggest that Rishi Sunak is succeeding in sort of quelling the rebellious groups, quelling rebellion, or is rebellion just having a bit of a kip at the moment? Well, I mean, I think as you move towards the general election, a lot of MPs, you know, believe maybe rightly that divided parties don't win elections. So I think you do get a tendency towards, you know, pulling back a little bit. He's put some significant members of the ARG, obviously, in government as well, Steve Baker being the, the perhaps the most obvious example, as well as Suella Braverman. Um, and, and that's helped. I think... He's not the Brexit hard man anymore, though. No, he's not. No. no. He, um, he really did pull back from that, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's, he's had a bit of a, a kind of epiphany, really, if <laughs> that's an appropriate word. Transformation, but, as, but, it, yeah, as for, you've... For Steve. Um, yeah, for Steve. But... Um, so, and I think you always have to remember that although the ARG, the COVID recovery group, the Northern Research Group, you know, we're, we're talking about them today. I saw an article about them. They're calling themselves the five families, all these groups, like this kind of mafia, Cosa Nostra thing, you know. So, I mean, I, I, think, I think you always have to remember that there is, if you like, a kind of fairly solid, silent majority in the Conservative Party who, frankly, get fed up with those people and just want them to you know, quieten down a little bit so they can get on with trying to win the election. And I think most Conservative MPs, you know, now realise it's basically Rishi or bust for them. Mm -hmm. Johnson's not going to make a comeback, as far as they're concerned, at least not this side of an election. And, um, you know, that, that uh, really, uh, you know, they're... I think we've probably reached peak ERG for the moment. But having said that, um, you know, what happens on this um, renewal of EU legislation um, bill, that will be quite interesting because... It's on pause at the moment. Well, it's on it, pause, think, but apparently it's, coming, track it's coming back to the Lords, actually, um, uh. in, you know, in fairly short order, apparently. Um, and who knows, you know, the, the rather kind of pathetic um, vote on the Windsor framework, you know, there's only 22 Conservative rebels. That might have been achieved by promising them something on the renewal of EU legislation bill. Who knows? So there might be a pre oh, quid pro right. quo there. Yeah. OK. Um, we did touch on COVID earlier, but it, it's Brexit is the, in yeah. the title of the yeah. book. But quite a lot of it is about the Tory government's handling of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, what did COVID do to the party, do you think? Well, I mean, it did for Boris Johnson, for one thing. Um, I think it once again uh, reminded Not us... Not following the rules. You yes, mean. yeah. But I, I, think, mm. um, I think once again it reminded us that the, the Conservative Party, although it's traditionally liked to um, present itself as, you know, a sort of un unideological, pragmatic party, actually is quite ideological. I mean, the arguments that COVID generated within the party and within the Cabinet, um, you know... Um, fell along pretty ideological lines. You know, you had um, the kind of hardcore Thatcherites wanting to open up uh, earlier, you know, not wanting to lock down. Um, and as you mentioned, Rishi Sunak, Rishi Sunak was, 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 key was absolutely in that group. Um, one of those. Um, mm. and, and I suppose it, it, it just sort of reinforced some of these kind of ideological uh, divisions there. I mean, I think it also exposed um, the, the government, you know, to, to the charge that, you know, it, it wasn't as, as sort of competent, really, as um, a government could or, or should be. Uh, and that clearly, I think, has damaged the Conservative brand for, for many people. And then, of course, the hypocrisy of Partygate has, has been a, a very big um, blow, I think, to, to the Conservative Party. But, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I am glad you've asked me about COVID because one of the, one of the things um, I have found in, in doing, you know, some of the interviews I've done about this book is people do want to talk about Brexit, but they don't want to talk about COVID. And I think that is partly because none of us want to talk about COVID anymore, right? Well, we just want to forget it and, mm. and, and, and um, you know, hope it never comes back. But actually, you know, we were living through a complete nightmare and so was the Conservative Party for quite a long time. And although, you know, Brexit 
it is the, you know, the, the kind of key in some senses to what's happened to the Conservative Party after 2016. Actually, a lot of its time was completely consumed with, with COVID and, and possibly that had an impact on, on the way that you know, we eventually did a deal um, with, with the, the European Union, which, you know, quite frankly, wasn't as good as perhaps it could have been. But, you know, the government was otherwise occupied in some ways. But, you know, we're talking about years of mayhem. And as, as I said earlier, it's, it's almost as if we didn't realise what we were living through mm. as we were going through it. And on reflection now, we think, my goodness, how did we escape that? How yeah. did we how did we get through COVID mm. unscathed um, in some instances yeah. and and very very badly damaged and hurt so many people, um, but also the the mayhem within the party. But I remember covering politics after the the Maastricht debates. I mean, I started sort of hanging around in the Commons lobbies mm. in um, sort of 1992 and. You know, Maastricht scarred mm. the party then. You had your, your whipless rebels who also were stirring up trouble. But is it just that the, the numbers weren't there? They, weren't, they didn't have the same sort of influence as the Brexiters do now? Uh, or do you see any kind of comparisons between, mm. you know, the 90s for the Tories and, and the Tories. Yeah, I mean, uh, comparisons, yes, but also just I think the 90s basically sowed the seeds um, for, you know, what, what we've seen over the last few years, to be honest. I think, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Maastricht Treaty plus the fall of Margaret Thatcher created, you know, a very kind of poisonous atmosphere within the party, um, which, uh, you know, over time, um, led to far more Eurosceptics being elected as MPs uh, and the Conservative Party's balance, if you like, on Europe eventually swinging um, towards uh, a much more Eurosceptic uh, position. And then, of course, Brexit simply accelerated that because there were many who voted Leave who then felt, you know, like Theresa May, that they had to, um, you know, show that they were kind of even more Leave than the Leavers in some ways to, mm -hmm. to make sure that they shored up their position uh, in the Conservative Party party uh, and you know we are where we are in part because of you know Maastricht and and, and the fall of, of Margaret mm -hmm. Thatcher I think the other thing is is that you know that the, the fear of the Conservative Party and it's the fear of many centre-right parties in Europe actually is being outflanked on the right uh, and it's a particular fear uh, in the Conservative Party in the UK because unlike um, continental Europe, where if you get a populist radical right party who gets you know, 10, 20% of the vote, they might get 10, 20% of the seats in parliament. And therefore, if you have to, as a centre-right party, you can do a deal with those people and stay in government. In the UK, the problem is, you know, UKIP can get 4 million votes in 2015, but only one seat. So that's no use to you at all as the Conservative Party. Mm. Um, and worse, worse than that, some of those votes will come from you <laughs> rather than from, from Labour or, or from other parties. So, you know, the, the absolute priority, and I think this is how you understand Boris Johnson's rise to power, if you like, the absolute priority for the Conservative Party has been to you know, stymie support for, partly by co-opting the agenda of UKIP, uh, the Brexit party, and indeed, to some mm -hmm. extent, reform UK. Uh, and, you know, I don't think you can understand what's happened in the Conservative Party without understanding that kind of structural electoral problem, that threat that they, you know, they have to do everything to prevent. But just, I mean, you're saying, and you conclude that you... Conservative Party, it isn't dead yet, yeah. effectively. Yeah. Um, you know, it faces massive headwinds, the, the problems with the economy, the small boats issue, the NHS, uh, strikes, um, immigration, all of that. You catalogue mm. what a mess it's basically been mm. since Brexit. And we're on mm. our fifth prime minister now since then. And, and yet you are not writing off the Tories. This book is not saying this is how the Tory party died. 
you can never write them off. Um, they still have an ability to surprise. That the party is very adaptable. Mm. You you mm. make that point. Mm. Um, just give us a little bit more on, on why you think that. Well, I mean, it partly comes back, I think, to the populist appeal that we were talking about earlier. I think you know there there is a section of British society that um, you know <coughs> that appeal uh, is. It, it, you know, resonates with, uh, and I, I think you've also got to remember that the Conservative Party, if it's anything else, is the is the English Nationalist Party, and, and England is is so much uh, a, uh, you know a bigger a part of the UK that means if they can win in England, they they will almost certainly win in the UK, um, you know, generally. So I think that's quite important. I think uh, you know they they have a reputation. On the economy, which might not be particularly well deserved, but you know is, is reinforced perhaps by some commentators, and, and uh, I think you know that that makes a difference as well. And then you have to look at the opposition. Mm. Um, you know, it, Jeremy Corbyn essentially created the the Labour Party in 2019, and it will be very very unusual for a party to come back from its worst defeat you know, since 1935 mm. to win a majority. I mean, it doesn't normally happen like that. It takes two or three terms to come back. Uh, so, uh, you know, Labour faces a huge mountain to climb. It's got a leader who has effectively put the party in a much better position than it was in when he took over, but he's not a particularly inspiring or uh, appealing um, figure for, for many voters. And the uh, polls still yeah. seem to suggest that when it comes to things like economic competence, yeah, yeah. the Tories are in there. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're certainly not a lost cause. But having said that, I think the fundamentals are quite difficult for the Conservative Party. I mean, I think unless you can, you know, get, and getting a bit nerdy about this, unless you can get real wages rising within about six months of an election, I think you're in quite a lot of trouble. Uh, I think given you know, the problems in the NHS, which aren't being made any work, um, better by the strikes because that's increasing the backlog, um, that's going to be a, a real problem. And I'm not sure any amount of you know, banging on about small boats, particularly if you can't deliver on the promise, is actually going to kind of distract or make up for the failings on the economy, stupid, or the NHS, which traditionally are you know, two very big mm -hmm. issues for, for most voters. Um, but having said that, yeah, I mean, never say never. You, you, you can't write them off, um, you know, for all the reasons that uh, we, we've just discussed. Uh, you know, and then, of course, you know, you've got the question of, well, what next? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you talk about um, the Conservatives being the party of English nationalism. Uh, for Labour to win a majority at the next election, they need to get more seats in Scotland then, don't they? Um, and how do you view their chances of that? I mean, they need to get, what, 120 seats? They need to gain 120 seats to have a majority of one. Yeah. Is that possible for Labour? Can they do it? They've got an even greater uphill task than Tony Blair had yeah. in, in yeah. 97 yeah. because of the way the yeah. seats are distributed. Well, look, I mean, I, I, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure it's possible for the Labour Party to win a you know, comfortable majority. Um, but they got a huge advantage over the Conservatives in the sense that they've got a whole bunch of other parties uh, at Westminster who would be prepared either to tolerate a Labour government or, or to do a deal with the Labour government. And the problem for the Conservatives, as we've already alluded to, mm. is there's no one there who's going to do a deal with them, unless the DUP, um, you know, once again, <laughs> gamble on the Conservative Party giving them what they want. But surely the DUP have realised by now that every time they do a deal with the Conservative Party, they get sold out, but, but who knows? Mm. So, final question then. Yeah. Um, do you think that we could, if we have a, an election next year, um, if Labour were to become a minority government or it's a hung parliament, do you think we could see two elections in quick succession, you know, 1974 style? Yeah, I mean, the obvious thing to do for a government that wins uh, a minority and can't uh, or chooses not to do a, a kind of coalition deal is to do what Wilson did in, in 74 and go for another election. I mean, but the problem is, and the lesson from, I guess, Wilson is that that doesn't necessarily mean that we'd won bound or free because he ended up getting majority. But I think somebody in the audience will correct me. It was a majority of about four or something like it was that. Three. Three, okay. Yeah. And it, it didn't it didn't last very long. So perhaps Keir Starmer wouldn't do that. He'd be a, he'd be probably better advised if if the Liberal Democrats could be 
convinced and maybe the SNP who knows to tolerate the situation to do a deal with, with them for some kind of coalition mm. uh, government. And then, of course, you've got the question of, well, what happens to the Conservative Party and, and what direction they can go in? But that's maybe something we can talk about, you know, now. All right. Tim, thank you ever so much. That was great. And uh, just have a round of applause for Tim Bale. Thank you. Bale. Thank you. Great